If it goes right, it's a slice. If it goes left, it's a hook. If it goes straight, it's a miracle. This is Out of Bounds. If it's happening in the world of golf, we're talking about it. Coverage, debate, discussion, pro golf and local golf. Let's do it. This is Out of Bounds. And here are your hosts, Nate Sharman and Josh Derso. All right, welcome to the Zurich Classic of New Orleans preview episode of the Out of Bounds podcast. Josh Derso, Nate Sharman here. Uh, we have all of the information you are going to need to get ready for this weekend's event. And we're also going to talk a little bit about some golf news. Uh, Nate, we are here to a little bit of a unique event and a nice breather, I think, after the last um, two to three weeks on the PGA Tour. Yeah, we stopped now for a non-elevated event, right? We had the elevated one last week, the Masters before that, so we're, you're right. We've been a little bit busy with that, but that's not going to stop a lot of these top players from playing. You have uh, four of the top, we'll give it 11 players in the world, right, playing this week. Morikawa, Homa, Shoffley, and Cantlay. We'll get into this, some of those guys a little bit later on here, but they're also playing, so pretty cool to see even you know if we have some top guys still playing and, and even not an elevated purse event. Yeah, it's interesting too because, um, and we talked a little bit about this before we came on. Team golf, it's something a little different for for right. those you know who watch tournaments week in and week out. This feels a little different. Um, it's a nice shift. We'll we'll see what uh, we'll see how this turns out. I think you uh, you had hinted at a really interesting factor. I think um, with how some of these teams are comprised, but we will get uh, into that here in a few minutes. Uh, I'm curious, Nate, when you think about team golf and this version of team golf, meaning two man teams, um, what do you do? You like it? Do you kind of come down in the middle on it? Um, or would you rather see larger team events like what Liv is doing um, right. where you have more players on each team? So I like it in the fact that the Zerge Classic is um, two, like you said, two team and they play alternate shot one day and uh, best ball the other day. So I think in that regard, it's a tad easier than the live way to kind of know where you're standing. Live has done a great job at kind of showing that on leaderboards and stuff, kind of knowing what the rules are and stuff like that. So I think it's a little bit more fun because that's really relatable too, because we have tournaments that we play in every year. We play in once a year, we play alternate shot together. So I think people are able to resonate with that a little bit more. And like I said, last podcast, I think it's just, it's just fun to see different stuff, right? We've seen this tournament since 2017 be a team event and not just be a redundant Monday in 72 holes stroke play event, which yeah. is something we see 40 times on the PGA Tour a season. So it's it's fun to be different. You know, I like that. And but the problem is with it not being a not elevated event. So the purse is only around 8.6 million. A lot of the guys aren't going to play. We still, like I said, still seeing four of the top 11 guys in the world playing. But I think they're kind of, like you said, in a kind of a weird sort of middle ground of not being an elevated event, but being different, being a little bit special in that regard. So I'm kind of interested to see where this tournament goes in the next few years when we see all these elevated event and higher purse events happening on the PGA Tour. Yeah, I think there's some stuff. I think there's some schedule stuff to work out for the PGA Tour. Yeah, um, in a couple different I, ways, right? I think with how or or where certain events are placed on the schedule, um, probably needs to be revisited at some point in the next couple of years. Um, of course, this is the first time around, so everybody understands, everybody gets it. I I like this form of team golf because I think it's easier for the casual viewer to wrap their head around. Um, Two-man teams who are playing together on the same hole is a lot easier for the casual uh, golf watcher to uh, grasp than um, the larger format team game i also like like you said um shaking things up with different formats that's always really cool um you know we talked extensively two weeks ago on the podcast about how much we love match play and how we want to see match play be uh, a part of the pga tour moving forward and i think this is another example of like you know among all of the things that the pga tour is trying to change i think seeing more um more different events that resonate with the average golfer. So the people who are, you know, maybe playing in a bunch of charity scrambles throughout the year, or maybe the people who are playing in, in different kind of like weekend events, uh, just with their buds and not like for anything or for any like serious, 
uh, you know, serious prize at the end, but just, you know, to, to make it a little more interesting than just straight up stroke play. Right. Agreed. So, you know, I, I, that's, to me, that's kind of where the tour just needs to do more. They need to go all in on it because events like this can be awesome. Um, you know, I, I think one, one caveat here is, you know, it's a non-elevated event. I don't think you can put any more money into these special events. If we're going to call them that, I think you got to stick with, um, you got to stick with the traditional events being your big money events, but that doesn't mean you can't make these lesser events, uh, more of a spectacle, more interesting, um, and just as important and fun in the, the big picture of the tour. And you got, I think you got to be really careful about where you're kind of placing. And we go back to the schedule, right? Because these, some of these bigger guys that are playing this week have to play the masters. They played the heritage, you know, it's, it gets really, really busy. So it, I think the PGA tour is going to have a really, a lot of fun scheduling the next few years. We already see some difference on the PGA tour next year with those limited field elevated events. So everything's just going to be continuing to change and that's okay for most PGA tour fans. We're going to, we're going to realize that, you know, we're trying something new here and, and that's okay. So but it's, it's really good for this event to, to stay a team event, I think. I think they've done a nice job in the last five years of branding themselves as the team event, right? You yep. have the Zurich Classic. It's their classic. It's it's the team event. It's nothing yep. else. You know, you, you talk about the Honda Classic or the John Deere or any of those these random kind of events where they're, they don't have a ton to kind of stand by. Maybe the golf course they play or something of that nature. But this is able to say, you know, we're the team event that puts, you know, Xander Shoffley and Patrick Cantlay together on a team and has them play together. And do very well too, which we'll get into. But I think I think that's cool for the PGA Tour to kind of have that event, whether it be elevated or not, to kind of have themselves to be able to brand it as that two-person team event. Yes. Um, speaking of that, let's get into that because I think that's that's kind of an important factor here. It's not an elevated event, but we have some really strong players in the field, um, and a couple of those players, defending champs. Um, happen to both be in the top 10 in the world. Should there be a rule preventing something like this from happening at an event like this one? I think I'm in the middle with that because on one hand, you know, it's it's really tough when you get Patrick Cantley and Xander Shoffley together, two top five or six players in the world. Yeah. And they've been playing really good golf too. I think they both came top 15 in the Masters. They came top five in the Heritage last week. So they're playing just unreal golf and they're unreal golfers. So there's nothing that currently can stop whoever from teaming up and playing against each other. So I think it could be a good way to kind of reduce teams is to, to kind of have a rule like that, but it could backfire on you because we've always talked about how the PGA tour and even other professional sports tour or associations for that matter should do a nice job of marketing their stars. Right. So letting these guys play together because, you know, the casual golf fan can say, oh, this team's fun to root for. Let's root for these guys because they're the best golfers in the world and people we see each and every week. You know, we extensively see Patrick Cantlay on the TV broadcast. Maybe that's because he takes a while to hit it, but we see a lot of his shots, especially over the last two weeks, he's been playing so well. And Xander's another guy we see on TV a lot too. So I think by having them play together, it can do a great job with brand recognition and getting your stars and marketing them as two players playing with each other. Yeah. What and I think, think? The, I agree. Um, but I think you need more of them if you're going to have those caliber players playing. And maybe together, you have to right? make it elevated, right? Because if you elevate it and you somehow get the purse up, you can get more of the guy. You can get the John Rahm, Scotty Scheffler, Jordan Spee, Thomas to come play, but they may not play in it if it's a non elevated event. Yeah. And okay. I think that would be so carrying off of that one. I, I think one interesting way of, you know, working through that would be to say, take the top 64 players, you know, basically uh, snake draft them one 64, two 63, three 62, um, yeah. and establish your teams that way. If it's going to be an elevated event and see what you see, what you could potentially, you know, come up with that way. Okay, um, yeah. you know, as is, I think it's fine. I think the the great thing about this event and the great thing about it not being an elevated event is that it doesn't matter, right? Like whoever can play with whoever. And it's more about, I think it's more about the fun than it is about 
you know, the outcome and, you know, its implication on the FedEx and everything like, like that, none of that stuff really matters. So, you know, I think if you're going to leave it as is, it's a great, you know, kind of jumping off point for introducing different kinds of golf to uh, people who are watching the PGA tour and you just, you just live with it. Right. Um, you know, I also think like, I feel like every time there is a, a favorite expected to win, and obviously last year wasn't the case, um, but every time there's a favorite expected to win an event like this, you see a team come out of nowhere and they end up winning it. I was looking through some of the past winners and it was interesting because it, it isn't, it wasn't always who you'd expect to win every single year. So, you know, there's always, there's always chance. There's always a chance that a couple, you know, a couple mid cards go out and play really well this right. weekend and win the thing, you know, the, the scores, you know, it looks like we're going to probably be between like 25 and 30 under par for the the final score. Yeah. I think we could even beat that. I think we could hit 30 under there yeah. were 29 last year. So, yeah. So, you know, that'll be, that'll be something to watch. Um, but not, uh, not, you know, nothing that I think a, a new rule needs to be established for. Right. Morikawa and uh, Homa playing together. They also almost they almost would violate that proposed rule we were talking about. Morka was eleventh, so pretty much the same thing. Homa Homa being seventh, right? So that's another fun turn, uh, fun grouping to watch this week. They had a really cool announcement. I'm not sure if you saw it on Twitter, where they were both holding up. It was almost kind of like a golf polesal, I call it, where they're both holding up uh, da- uh, L.A. Dodgers uniform. They both went to the University of California. They're holding up Dodgers uniforms with with the other person's name on it. So it's just kind of a fun thing between Morikawa and Homa. They've always been close. Yeah, and events like this allow all those relationships that exist on tour to be put on full display, which is right. really cool for everybody. Another cool one, too, is uh, reigning PGA champion, PGA tournament champion, Matt Fitzpatrick's bringing his brother along. You know, Alex Fitzpatrick, he's a couple years younger than Matt playing over on the DP world tour right now, kind of like how Matt did beginning of his career. They're teaming up and playing together this week, which is really something really cool. I think uh, Alex has played one event on the PGA tour came last year at the Valles bar where he missed the cut. So pretty cool for Matt uh, to uh, bring little brother Alex along with him, especially after he won last week. They also had a cool golf puzzle where uh, the PS like, a, they have like a family group chat. And Matt texted him and said, "Hey Al, are you free these dates? The, I think it's the, the dates of the tournament this weekend." And <laughs> he's like, "Yeah, of course, I'll I'll play with you." <laughs> so Alex can can uh, earn some points and, and get some uh, recognition out there too with Matt this week. All in the family. And speaking of that, let's get into uh, odds talk here for the week. Uh, top five odds, boy, it's the stack teams, the ones you'd expect, right, Nate? Yep. Cantley Shoffley coming at three to one. How often do we see somebody at three to one to win a golf three tournament? To one. Uh, more Kawahoma, 900 plus 900. Uh, Sanjay M and Keith Mitchell at plus 1200. Siwoo Kim and Tom Kim at 14 to one. And Billy Ho and Sam Burns, who came in second last year, round out the top five at 1600. Josh, who are you taking? Uh, you know what? I'm taking Siwoo Kim and Tom Kim. Uh, looking at the lineup, I think it's easy to pick Cantley, Shoffley, or uh, the the Morikawa, uh, Homa team. But at the end of the day, I'm looking at the group that's just on the outside of that. That's going to be able to fly a little bit under the radar. And I like to pick those guys. I like to pick the ones that you know aren't necessarily getting all of that front runner attention because um, they could have the they could go out and just play some really good golf. They both have it in them and win this thing. Easy. What do you so got? So I, I was looking through and, and I was getting, I was ready to pick the, the Billy Horschel, Sam Burns team. And I almost had it written down too. I was looking through it and then looking through some other stuff. And I just came to the agreement that I kind of feel bad about it, but I can't pick against Cantley and Shoffley. I just can't do it. You know, at three yeah. to one, you know, it's really low odds, right? But they won this tournament last year at 29 under, like we said. And I expect them to, to get to that 30 number this year, both playing just incredible golf the last few weeks. And their record in team events is, is unbelievable. You know, in foursomes, which is alternate shot in the Ryder Cup slash President's Cup, when they've played together, they're five and zero. Oh. They haven't lost. So these guys are obviously friends off the course too, and they play some good golf when playing together. So I can't not pick them. And when we're looking at our long shot picks, those guys outside the top ten, I'll go first. Harris English, 
Tom Hoagie at plus 3,000. I think they're far enough outside that um, favorite contender pool to to really be able to fly under the radar. And, you know, five career wins between the two of them. Uh, English finished, finished T2 at Bay Hill this year. I, you know, they've they've got the... Uh, they've got what they need to be able to uh, do well this weekend. They could win it. Tom Hoagie's still on my band list from the Masters tournament. You remember I had that little make the cut, that little make the cut up bat, <laughs> and Tom Hoagie missed the cut. Corey Connors missed the cut too that week, so I was only one for three, but I'm going to take a little break on Tom Hoagie. A good player, though. I like that pick. I'm going with the even longer one, uh, plus 9,000. Ben Griffin and Ryan Gerrard. Two guys that played together at UNC. You know, I like Ben Griffin, a rookie on rookie on this PGA Tour. I think Jarrett is a rookie, too. He gained a special exemption beginning of this season. So Ben Griffin been playing some decent golf as of late. We've seen his name kind of floating around here and there. So I expect him and uh, his college teammate, Ryan Gerard to play well this week at, uh, and possibly contend uh, the Zerk. Yeah, and uh, we won't be doing any... Uh... DFS lineups this week. Obviously, it's a team event. It's a little wonky. Yeah, um, I, I remember it being not as wonky, but I, I looked at it today when I was kind of looking through lineups and I was a little bit confused. So I, I figured we would just take the week off. I still got a lineup in there, but um, yeah, it was a little bit weird. Yeah. Um, also, DraftKings, if you happen to be listening, please, please make it easier for people to deposit money in your in your app it constantly it's a nightmare every on the rare occasion when i have to actually deposit money into the into the app dfs draftkings is talking to my bank and they can't communicate and it just needs to be easier let's fix this damn thing let's make it work let's make it make it right draftkings get it together please um That's probably a good idea for them yeah anyway uh fall golf not yeah. not for us right not fall golf for us but the PGA Tour has announced uh, updates to the fall schedule. Nate, what's it looking like? Yep. So they came out with, right, you said the fall schedule, and it's the best one that we've had, right? We've we've been seeing, you know, changes to the PGA Tour schedule, and we were kind of wondering what they're going to do this fall. But the PGA Tour announced that seven, seven tournament. It's almost like a little mini series for the players kind of looking to gain um, spots into the PGA Tour next year in some of these elevated events. So, be for guys outside the top 50 looking to kind of jump in and get into those elevated events. And so some of the, some of the different uh, achievements, if you win on this fall event are going to stay the same, you know, the exemption and some of the FedEx cup points are going to be pretty much similar, but the whole big thing that picked out to me was 10 players, not including the ones that are previously eligible with the most season long FedEx cup through the, through the fall season will earn exemptions into the first two elevated events next year which is just could be life-changing. We've talked about some of the $20 million purses we see. So all it takes is these guys getting into the elevated events, which some of them will be no cut next year too. These yep. guys kind of striking fire in the fall and then one or two of these tournaments also striking fire again and making a ton of money and earning some FedEx Cup points in the 2024 season. Yeah, so I have a theory Wait, on what? what the PGA Tour was trying to accomplish here. If you look back through... Um, the last 15 years, just whole whole season long schedule. You will see um, in a lot of weeks throughout the year, guys winning events that aren't household names. They aren't the people you'd expect to win. They certainly wouldn't have been the people who were getting picked coming into those weeks. Um, and those guys were able to make careers out of that, right? Like we we we've seen guys be able to make long careers out of occasional wins and just kind of, you know, hanging around this new schedule system really makes it impossible for those guys. And I'm talking about the elevated versus non-elevated. Um, it really makes it impossible for those guys to carve out those kinds of careers without giving them some way to get into an elevated event here or there. And this fixes, this addresses that. This right. makes it so that the guys who are in that under the radar, um, you know, in that lot of, you know, good golfers, but not necessarily household names, they can play some good golf. They can sneak their way into a couple events and you don't need to win those events, right? Like right. what we've seen is that you can just literally, you know, top five, top 10, top 20, and it's still life-changing money. Yeah. You make the so, cut even, right? Yeah. Right. So I, I think that is um, 
this fall season, if you want to call it like a mini tour kind of scenario, um, does a great job of making sure that we still have that in professional right. golf. And it'll be compelling too. I think that's the biggest part. You know, you'll be able to kind of attach yourself to guys early in the season who are playing to try to gain status for the next year. You know, a lot of young guys coming out of college, if that, or in, you know, in that young twenties area, will be playing in these events, <laughs> trying to, to gain status, like I said. So it'll be, it'll be very fun and, and compelling to watch. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And not only that, but think about it, if it ended, if the season ended right now, I believe Ricky Fowler is at number 52. Yeah. He's right. So there. he's one of those guys that certainly would be getting a following. Um, you've also got a lot of guys who are in kind of like the upper forties who could be on the outside looking in. I think of like a Kevin Kisner, who I think last check was like 47, 48 ish on the number probably. Yeah. Um, so again, like you could have some, you could have some established names as well in this thing that would, would just make for really interesting golf at a time when we normally don't see interesting golf. Right. And also it's not spread out seven tournaments, you know, basically a couple months. I like, I like that it's packed in. Yeah. Might as well do it. You know, the fall that sometimes we throw away for golf, right? On the PGA tour. So, you know, let's, let's watch it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Big announcement here uh, on the podcast, huge, huge announcement. Um, We have a website now. It's, outofboundsgolfpod.com. You're going to see it all over our, our branding here. You're going to see it all over our stuff on social media. Um, we're going to be posting all of our shows there. We're going to be posting a lot of golf news there. We're going to be posting all of the uh, editorial content that we uh, create between the two of us, um, whether that's the stuff that's going out onto TikTok, if you follow us there, Instagram, um, Twitter, whatever the case may be. We're going to be posting even more of it, probably going to be doing some uh, new stuff that we, uh, we've we talked about in the past, but haven't necessarily had the platform to do, uh, and even some new stuff that we haven't thought of yet. So um, I would say great idea would be if you have an idea for something that you want us to do content-wise, you should drop us a line at outofboundsgolfpod at gmail.com, right? Right. That's step yeah, one. I think the website's just going to be awesome because it's going to be a centralized place where, you know, golf lovers and viewers like us are going to be able to go in there and talk golf, right? You know, yep. if there's a, de- a debate topic on our mind that you want us to talk about or to anyone to talk about for that matter, you can go there, outofboundsgolfpod.com, talk about it. You'll, you'll see me and Josh kind of in those comments, commenting back with you and having good discussions about things. So really looking forward for the the interactive side of things for, for people to interact with us and, and be able to talk golf because I could talk golf all day. That's pretty clear. Yeah. And that's also going to give us a chance to start to highlight some of the things that you all are actually talking about uh, here on the podcast too. So it's going to be right. kind of a whole circular uh, pattern. Um, but we'll have more on that probably in the next week or so. We'll get some stuff on, out onto social media for everybody to wrap their head around what we're doing and, and where to find all of that. But that is going to do it for this week's Out of Bounds. We will be back on Sunday to recap the Zurich. Follow Out of Bounds on TikTok, Instagram, and of course, subscribe here on YouTube. And remember, whether it is down the middle or out of bounds, keep on swinging. You've been listening to Out of Bounds. If it's coverage, debate, or discussion of pro and local golf, we'll be talking about it. Be sure to visit the website at FingerLakes1.com. Find us on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at Out of Bounds FL1. See you next time on Out of Bounds. Out of Bounds.